with everything that's happening uh, right now, I'm terrified that these institutions are going to start to fall apart or become much more niche and that it's not going to be um, part of uh, like popular culture to go. I mean, that's the other real beauty of, you know, of movies and of movie theaters is it's, it's not like a, uh, it's not like an expensive elitist activity. It's something that so many different types of people, um, everybody can go to the movies and do it together and, and there's a real beauty in Remember the voice in your head? The one that said, sneak away. Wendy, wait! What's a stop? This is an adventure, there are no stops. Here is the place it came from. So began the legend of Peter, the boy who would not grow up. I think that my, you know, my connection to, to the myth has always been kind of uh, separate from the versions of it, even the original version of the story. I think that like Peter has kind of taken on a life of his own in the world that's outside of any version of it. And for me, certainly my whole life, Peter has always been like um, almost like the god of youth. And so like when I think about staying young or think about growing up, it's always somehow in connection to this character. So when we kind of came to the realization that, that this was the film that we were gonna make, it never felt like it mattered any other version of it and didn't feel like we needed to retell any version of it. It felt like, you know, I, we had been, me and my, my sister Eliza, who I wrote the film with, we'd been on adventures with Peter our whole life, you know, that had nothing to do with any story. It was like he was this imaginary friend and we would do things with him and so, as we came back to him, it, was, it wasn't it was about, um, well, how do we tell this story again? It was like, let's talk about uh, why this character haunts us, you know, and haunts people across the world, haunts children, haunts adults. We still think about this guy for some reason. And what is the reason that he's so in the bloodstream of um, how we think about our lives as we, as we get older? And then what questions does he bring up and issues does he speak to? We wanted to create a version of this story that welcomes everybody into it again, you know, and you look back the, at the history of the story and so many people are excluded or are made to feel less than just by the nature of the story. But what, the thing that we thought about is like, that doesn't have anything to do with why people, people think about Peter Pan, you know? When we think about Peter Pan, we don't think about the original character of Wendy who never gets to go on any adventures. She's considered sort of weak and she's there to take care of the boys and she's excluded from everything that they do. We don't think about the Indians as they're called in the in the original or in the Disney version that, you know, the Lost Boys are just killing for some reason. You know, to me, those weren't the reasons why Peter is so important. They had nothing to do with it. It just was these historic elements that were in the story that I think uh, make people feel not welcome. We wanted to create a version of this story where to be a girl was something powerful, you know, where, where motherhood is an idea that uh, is like a superpower in our story, not something to be afraid of. It's not something that makes you uh, not participate in the adventure. It's something that uh, gives you powers that uh, the boys don't have. Um, you know, that, that's sort of how I think about representation. I think about it in, in terms of like, everyone should feel welcome in this story. Everyone should feel, I, I, to me, the story and the themes of Peter Pan are, are universal. And how do we retell this story in a way that um, it can truly be universal? I mean, anyone can watch the film and feel connected to the characters. I think it has to do with like, you know, want, again, sort of wanting to get films to be closer to life, you know, to me, like daily experience is so chaotic. It's like we don't have control over so many things that we go to the world in, you know, and, and movies sort of by the nature of the art form kind of work in the opposite way. It's all about control and it's about everything being precise and everything being planned and everything going according to time. And, you know, that is the structure around which movies are made. And to me, it loses this whole part of human experience, which is engaging with chaos and spontaneity and surprise and the unexpected. And there's no better way to kind of get those elements into your film than to engage with nature in a visceral way, especially water, you know, the most chaotic 
element and you know for us also bringing in volcanoes and bringing in the rainforest and when you sort of try to make a film in conversation with these elements nothing goes according to plan everything that you want that you envision is going to get moved by forces that are more powerful than you more powerful than your film and it's like a chemical reaction it's like you take a movie and you mix it with the ocean and you get something that you could never have predicted and i and i really am inspired by that by the unknown and the discovery that happens as part of that I live in New Orleans, so it's my home, it's my adopted home, and um, and I love it. It inspires me, so I think that um, that's the more basic reason is just because I'm working there and I'm casting people from there, and I'm drawn to Louisiana for those reasons. Just as a person, I think that um, nature is really visceral down there. You know, we're engaged with water and flooding and hurricanes, and you know, it's a it's a place where the land and the water meet, it's a delta, and those things all like mixed together and brought me there and, and also find their way into the films. I, th I thought about E.T. a lot as I was making this film, which is a film that I just loved my whole life and in some ways love more as an adult than I uh, ever did as a kid. It's probably the most consistent movie to make me cry. And uh, there's something in like the integrity he gives to kids, you know, and, and like the, especially I think about, I mean, just in the character of Elliot, just what uh, his power, his kindness, you know, he doesn't like shoot lightning bolts out of his hands, right? You know, he's just, he's kind. He has this incredibly strong heart and, and his heart is what connects him to this other character that no one else understands, you know, and, and, and I think that, I don't know, there's something so beautiful in that that I really felt like, you know, as we were thinking about Wendy, it's like, well, what is Wendy's superpower? You know, like Peter can stay young forever. What can Wendy do? And, and it has everything to do with the kindness of her heart and the size of her heart and the wisdom in her love. Both connected to this character and also to um, Devin herself, who plays Wendy, is so that person. Um, yeah, in terms of like, you know, I, I think for me, I'm, I have two very kind of like radically different sets of influences. Like I, I grew up on Spielberg and watching Indiana Jones and Jaws and E.T. and, you know, other never ending story, like these sort of big movies of that era. Me and, and particularly with my sister, we, me and Eliza would, uh, you know, go to the basement and watch these films hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, and so they're so part of our sense of kind of like our love for movies is so connected to like these stories that are so big in scale, you know, that feel like um, mythic, you know, and iconic and that we understand our lives through these stories. We learn how to be a hero or a villain or good or bad, like in these, in these movies. Um, and then I'm also, you know, really interested in filmmakers that sort of engage with um, kind of reality on a really visceral level, like Cassavetes and like documentary filmmakers like Les Blank, um, who kind of, you know, study the world as, as, it, as it happens in a more visceral way and represent it in a way that feels like, um, you know, very close to life. And, and I'm always sort of trying to find how both those things can sit together, you know, and not, not, not like realism, but like something that feels really naturalistic and really true to life and really recognizable as, as our uh, experience can also sort of achieve this incredibly mythic scale. Oh man, um, I don't. I don't know if I would go back to. I mean, animation. I love too much. Like when I was animating, I was like really obsessive, alone, had like way too complicated relationships with my like inanimate objects. You know, just like I loved sort of coming out of animation and like to engage with the world and people and characters. And in some ways, I'm like afraid to go back because it would go back into a hole of uh, darkness and uh, obsession. But it is something that I really, really love doing, and um, you never know. It's I, it always like really. I, I didn't set out to be a particular kind of filmmaker. It was like I had certain stories I wanted to tell. Um, when I was doing animation, I had no means to tell anything, so animation was a way that I could make a film entirely by myself, pretty much. You know, with a couple of people helping me build, and um, you know, but I didn't need a big budget. I didn't need a big crew. Um, I could do it in my room. You know, the the stories that are now, you know, everything sort of comes from what story you want to tell. So if there's a story that I wanted to tell that found me back into animation, I would probably go back, you know. You know, when you, when you create a film, you want people to be immersed in it, you know. Uh, you want people to leave 
their life and, and enter into uh, the world of the screen, you know, and the sound and everything. And I think that that's what theaters do. That's what they're designed for is to really transport you and to transport you not alone, but with with other people. And there's energy that kind of comes from watching something communally and, you know, the way that sort of the medium is going with all the different ways that people are, are watching films, you know, you it subtracts from the experience because, you know, you're watching a film while you're doing a million other things and you're on your phone, you know, and you don't get, you know, there's a lot lost in that. And I think a lot of art now and films are sort of being designed for you to be able to multitask while you watch them. But, I, you know, the way that I make films, you, you can't, you know, if you look away and you miss the shots or you don't hear something, it's like the story is being told in all the elements at, at, at every moment and you need kind of your complete attention in order to fully experience it. So um, to me, the theater is where you get that, you know, obviously, with everything that's happening right now, I'm terrified that these institutions are gonna to start to fall apart or become much more niche and that it's not gonna be um, part of uh, like popular culture to go. I mean, that's the other real beauty of, you know, of movies and of movie theaters is it's, it's, not like a, it's not like an expensive elitist activity. It's something that so many different types of people, um, everybody can go to the movies and do it together and, and there's a real beauty in. I don't know. No. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't know if I have a point of view, honestly. I, I think, I think, I think about how I want my films, how the films I want to make and how I want them seen. And I obviously hope that, uh, no matter what happens, people keep fighting to keep cinemas alive and to continue going to the movies, um, finding ways to adapt. But yeah, that's my, that's my hope. Well, do I think that's going to happen? I don't know. You know how to believe from here. The world has no end. It goes on and on forever. Run. Want to fly? 